Canada's Conservative Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmale, Member of Parliament for Halliburton, Fourth of Lakes Brock, with a great show lined up for you. We are going to talk about the disastrous hotel quarantine program implemented by the federal government. But first, because it's such great content, we're going to ask that you like, comment, subscribe, share this program. Help us push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. Of course, if you can't watch it all right this second, you can download it later on. Listen to it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you name it. It is out there and with new content every single Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I welcome a good friend of the show. Welcome her back, Michelle Rempel-Garner, the Member of Parliament for Calgary Nose Hill, also the Shadow Minister for Health. Thank you once again for coming on. Thanks for having me, Jamie. It's always a pleasure. So this hotel quarantine program, this is something that we have called for at the beginning, saying this is going to be problematic right from the start because the rules weren't really implemented very well anyway through travelers were getting by they weren't quarantining they were walking across the border oh my goodness then we had allegations of sexual assault happening of some of the travelers maybe you can just start from the beginning give us a a quick uh, summary of what has happened what you've dealt with and then we can go on to what the expert panel is reporting And what a history it's been. I think it's important to start at the beginning, which is the start of the pandemic uh, in late 2019, early 2020, when we started hearing reports of the spread of COVID coming out of China. Uh, At that point in time, Jamie, you'll remember sitting in the House of Commons where we were asking the federal government we should be closing the borders. We should be, you know, certainly undertaking greater screening measures uh, to prevent the virus from entering Canada. And you'll remember that the Liberal Health Minister and the Prime Minister at that time both flat out said that border measures don't work and uh, implied that they were racist as opposed to you know, looking at what the rest of the world was doing. So we lost those precious few months at the front end of the pandemic, the virus entered Canada, and then the Liberals were slow ever since then to deal with border control measures that could have helped stop the spread of the variant. Now, when they realized that it was politically unpopular to allow this virus into Canada through weak border control measures, like, I mean, the toothpaste was already out of the tube, right? They put in place the hotel quarantine program. Um, Jamie, if you watched me at health committee, I had federal officials in front of the committee and I asked them point blank, what data did you use to show that the hotel quarantine program was more effective at stopping the spread of COVID than at home quarantine combined with rapid testing? Crickets, nothing. They don't have data on this. Uh, Then as you rightly pointed out, there were reports of sexual assault. Clearly the government didn't think about this from the perspective of women traveling alone. Uh, then there, since then, there's been reports of the spread of COVID at these quarantine hotels. Uh, we have been calling for this ridiculous policy to be scrapped for a long period of time. Uh, they have not done that. Uh, we've continued these calls. And, you know, I'll let you have the big news for listeners today. But we, there, there are experts now who are agreeing with what we've been saying all along. Well, you saw this in committee here. They're basically saying the Public Health Agency of Canada is saying between February 22nd and May 4th, nearly 88,000 international arrivals happened. And many of those were not, um, many of those people coming in from international arrivals were not actually quarantining in the hotels. They basically walked right through because the rules were not uniform and it's not being implemented properly. It, It was just a buffet of errors all the way through. Absolutely. I'll just be very blunt and tell you what I think happened here. Uh, You know, as Canadian citizens, we do have the right to mobility. And there are people who have had to travel during the pandemic. Rather than, I'm sure that they considered exit permits and other things, because they're the Liberal government and they look at things like that. I would not be shocked if they did that. But as opposed to, you know, getting this these border control measures done at the front end of the pandemic, they let the virus in and then they put the quarantine hotel program in place to deter travel, uh, to deter particularly middle-class Canadians who don't have the means to pay this much amount of money upon a return arrival in Canada uh, to, to stop people from traveling. And really what that did was it deterred people 
who had legitimate means to travel, like uh, end of life care for uh, people abroad or dealing with funerals. I'm sure you had constituents call your office in this situation. I think we all did. Uh, and that's just abysmal. I mean, this was a failed policy to cover a failed policy and it's time that they end it. And again, now we have experts saying, yeah, yeah, it should be ended. So let's just build on that. So last week, the federal government's COVID-19, I'll get this right here, testing and screening expert advisory panel called for the abolishment of that controversial hotel quarantine plan that, as you mentioned, requires uh, travelers to stay three days in an approved hotel as they await the results of their test. Now, has the health minister actually updated the, the protocols to follow that and follow those recommendations, or are we still doing the same old thing? Well, the short answer is nope. Uh, Just to reemphasize what you just said for listeners today. So this is a panel of experts, medical experts, who were appointed by the federal government to give advice on federal restrictions like the border. And they, I heard, I've sort of heard through the grapevine that they've had this, that they submitted this report and these recommendations weeks ago and that the government actually extended the hotel quarantine program while having this report in their hand. I don't have sort of formal proof of that, but that's sort of the the gossip in the tourism industry, as well as when you look at the timing of when the last date that that panel met, and then when the report was actually put forward. So it's just, you know, they're not, the Liberal government and Paddy Haiju is not making decisions based on science. There are like the the United Kingdom, the United States, other countries around the world, the European Union, they're all saying, here's what you can do given your vaccine vaccine status. And of course, what this panel is recommending, because there'll be people are saying like, well, what I, I don't have a vaccine yet. What about me? They've recommended four categories of re- restrictions related to vaccination status. So unvaccinated, one dose, both doses, and or recovered from COVID. And in any of those scenarios, what they're saying is that the system that's in place right now is far too prescriptive, um, that we should be looking at ways to combine rapid testing with at-home quarantine uh, to to ensure that the spread of COVID is managed and and that the borders are protected, but at the same time, understanding that at some point life has to get back to normal and we need a clear plan for this. So those recommendations, the the Liberal government has to decide what they want to do with it, but we should be making decisions based on science, not based on politics um, or incompetence, which is what has been the hallmark of the Liberal government to date. (laughs) And you even asked these questions of the finance minister a few days ago. You were, you were asking her when these protocols will be updated to reflect the new reality, the science that is coming out that is showing that other countries are easing restrictions on those that are fully vaccinated for one. But we aren't seeing that same same thing happening in Canada. And not only that, are we as, as a country updating our regulations to deal with those that are fully vaccinated that have had it done in a country, say the United States, are we recognizing uh, that type of vaccine, um, I guess- needle, Vaccination needle, status. Needle. Yeah, the status, I guess that's- Yeah, no, I've had, I'm sure you've had people call your office too. Many people asking, hey, I got my vaccine in the US or I had one dose of vaccine in the US, one dose of vaccine here in Canada. How can I get proof of vaccination? I'd like to have that proof of vaccination. And I've asked the federal government this many times, like what system are you putting in place so that people who want to have that proof of vaccination, that they can easily get that? And the answer is, I don't know. And you know, it's just unconscionable thinking about how much money the federal government has wasted on like things like the We Charity scandal, right? Surely, a developed country like Canada, a G7 country, should be able to provide for people who want it proof of vaccine status if they've received vaccines in other jurisdictions. Um, there are many Canadian snowbirds who are in this boat. Um, and frankly, there's many Canadians who have been part of provincial programs like Manitoba has, has put in place with um, uh, state governments in the U.S. for truck drivers and teachers. Same with uh, Alberta and Montana. Uh, it's just, 
It's a gong show, Jamie. Every day I feel like I'm beating my head against a brick wall with these people. They're working in a bubble. They're not thinking about the actual realities of the situation. And they think they think that they're on top of it, but they're living in a fantasy weirdo world where actual problems are not getting solved. So, you know, thank you to you and the rest of our caucus too, and our leader for just like continually pushing them on these issues because that we, we deserve answers for them, right? Yeah, especially when the government had three really main things to look after, right? Vaccines, borders, and rapid tests. And yep. how do you think they did, did on all three of those? And we can tell that because we look at where other countries are in their reopening plans. Absolutely. It's like fail, fail, fail. And look, I think that I don't understand why. Wait, wait, I'll, I'll back up. I know why the federal government isn't talking about metrics for reopening within their jurisdiction. I know why they're not doing that. And that's because we're so far behind getting the second dose of vaccine. Right now, because there aren't sort of those perks associated with double vaccination status, right? I think that a lot of people are like, okay, well, I'll wait. It's no big deal. But the minute that the federal government starts talking about uh, being able to to travel without quarantine, as this report recommends, people are going to say, oh, well, hello, where's my second dose? Uh, and I think that, that 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 lack of supply, they've managed that so badly, that's just one of the implications of the lack of supply, as is this vaccine mix and match issue that we're hearing about today, as is so many other things. And, you know, the provincial governments can't deliver supply they don't have from the federal government. So, yes, they've completely, you know, messed up on this, but they need to be giving Canadians some hope. They need to be giving people in the travel and tourism industry some hope. Frankly, frontline workers in the medical system, too, that show that we have a system at the border uh, that allows for travel while safely preventing the spread of COVID-19 that also reflects all categories of vaccination status and it is based on science. You just brought up something really important here and uh, I know we have to let you go, but <laughs> the, the, the vaccine time period, which was done at testing, I think Pfizer is 21 days, Moderna 28 days if memory serves, is the timeline between the first and second shot verified during the testing phase of the, of the manufacturers. Now, I, you just mentioned it, I, I think most people are realizing it, that the increased interval between the first and second dose, that, that was because the government of Canada had not secured enough vaccines to properly vaccinate their population within the prescripted time frame. Absolutely. The only reason we have the dosing delay in Canada is because we don't have enough supply. And that's on the record from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization at the Health Committee. It's, I asked point blank, would you be giving this advice if we had adequate supply? And the response that we got back was, of course not. So if you know Trudeau had not put all of Canada's prospects in this contract with this Chinese company that massively failed us and had been negotiating with the leading vaccine candidates like Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson at the start of the pandemic, and have been looking at ramping up our own domestic manufacturing capacity, we would not have been in this boat. And I have to say, Jamie, for people listening, the Conservative Party of Canada and the effective opposition that we brought to their bungling of this process, I think has a, is a big reason why we have vaccines in Canada today at all. We lit the fire and we didn't let up because it was the right thing to do. And I think history will remember you know, what an effective opposition did for our country during this period of time. And I think a lot of our colleagues uh, have to be given credit for that. Yeah, I don't think, I, I think that's very important to you. You've raised so many important points that the opposition did put their foot on the gas and put that pressure on the federal government. And then when I remember back over Christmas, things started to slow down, the media stopped paying attention, the house wasn't sitting. And so the government was kind of left to their, their, <laughs> their own devices here. And that's when they really failed. They put all their eggs in the casino basket. Nobody's really paying attention. They just messed up so many times over and over again. And then we finally had to put our foot back on the gas. Yeah, and I, I just, just to drive that point home, I had Pfizer Canada in front of our committee. They were officially testifying and they admitted on the record that the original contract that the Liberals negotiated with them for doses didn't have any doses 
arriving in Canada until the end of February and that the government had to go back at the end of November to renegotiate doses, even those, the, remember those few doses that they brought in for the photo op in December, but we didn't have vaccines in January and February to any great extent. Uh, the United States, Israel, European Union, the United Kingdom, they did. And I mean, I, I was on my Instagram feed last night, I was watching Grimes's feed and like there's this, massive outdoor concert where people are living their best life in, in Arizona. And it's, I'm like, oh, that's what getting back to normal looked like. Um, but in a more you know, serious context, think about the lives that could have been saved in this third wave if Trudeau had been able, had focused, taken this seriously and gotten us vaccines in January and February um, or rapid tests or anything or therapeutics quicker. It, it was just, they, there has to be an inquiry on this. Um, and we have to make sure that this never happens again. Uh, our leader has already um, committed to that, but we have, we have to do that. Uh, this is, it's just insane that we're here. Again, I don't know how you top that, but we do have to let you go. I always give the guests the last word, Michelle, the floor is yours. I, we have to get out of this. Uh, I know that a lot of Canadians are feeling very frustrated and they should feel frustrated right now. Uh, with many provinces now putting forward plans with benchmarks for reopening, every Canadian, regardless of political stripe, has to demand the same from the federal government for restrictions that are within the federal government's purview. Uh, there's science, there's better tools and better so sustainable solutions and we need hope. Uh, the federal government can't just be content to continue to say, uh, well, we, we don't have an end in sight. We, we can't tell you when life's going to get back to normal. So uh, this is what we're championing. Uh, this is what you're championing, Jamie. And I want to thank you for all the work you do. And, you know, the, the louder Canadians get, the, the, the easier it is for we are. It is for us to magnify and amplify their voices. So this is going to be a big push for us over the next few weeks. Michelle Rempel Garner, the Member of Parliament for Calgary Nose Hill, also the Shadow Minister for Health. We thank you so much for joining us today. Your content has been amazing. And because it has been amazing, she's always welcome back. But we ask you to like, comment, subscribe, share this program. Help us push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. Maybe there is someone within your social media network that might be open to hearing the conservative message. This is the way to help do that and ensure that Aaron O'Toole is the next Prime Minister of Canada. New content every single Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Again, if you can't watch it, listen to it all right this moment. Download it later on. Listen to it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. You name it, it is out there. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That is the blueprint.